Hello and welcome to the Odds Checker Betting Show. I'm your host, George Ellick, and this is the Coral Eclipse preview. I'm here joined by Andy Holding. Just the two of us today, Andy. Uh, normally a cracking weekend's racing with the Eclipse, the, the headline race, but we're sitting here at 20 to 12 on, on Thursday morning, probably a bit disappointed with final decks out that we only have four running in the race. Yeah, it was fairly predictable it was going to go like that. Uh, David Marnusio wrote a... Uh, a piece in the Racing Post, didn't he? I think it was either Monday or Tuesday, highlighting the fact that we might get um, uh, a very small field. Look, we've always had small fields in the Coral Eclipse. It's nothing mm. new. Um, you know, we, we, when you're dealing with the very, very best horses over a mile and a quarter, which is, at, let's, let's face it, a specialist trip. And we've just had Royal Ascot round the corner. And we've got the King George, you know, in, in the next month. Uh, sorry, coming up later in this month. It's, you know, there's only enough good horses to go around. Um, what we have got is a fantastic race between the four. And we've also got a very fascinating race as well, um, with, with obviously tactic going to play a huge part. So it's still not just going to, it's not going to be easy finding the winner, even though we've only got the four runners. But on the whole, yes, I agree. It, it's slightly disappointing that we have only got just the quartet. Yeah, quality over quantity is certainly the case, though, with, a, as you mentioned, a high class field, even if it is just four. Uh, the way we're going to do this, uh, going to run through three races on the day at Sandown. We'll do the Coral Charge, uh, which is the 150, the Group 3. Then on to the Distaff, which is the listed race just before the Eclipse at 3.35. I'll ask you, Andy, if you've got any other you want to flag up on the card at Sandown on Saturday. And then we'll just travel over to Haydock just to preview the Lancashire Oaks as well. And again, Andy, if you've got any others that you want to flag up uh, anywhere, really, on Saturday, then, uh, then you can flag them up then. Uh, before we get into the races themselves, just going to point the listeners and the viewers in the direction of the Odds Checker app. It has the best prices, the best bookie offers, free bets, place terms, and the very best tipsters, including, of course, Andy, whose tips you can find on the app every single morning of racing uh, as we go through the season, both during the summer and through the winter as well. So, as I mentioned, the first race we're going to cover is the Coral Charge, the 150, the Group 3, over five furlongs. And Arecibo is the 130 favourite Head of uh, came from the dark and Lazuli, who are both four to one. Keep busy, five to one. Uh, Atlas Bay, fifteen to two. Stone of Destiny, twelve to one. Eighteen to one. Bar. These are embryonic markets. You know, these have uh, the final decks been just over an hour ago. Uh, bookies rushing to get their prices out, so these might change a fair bit in the time between us recording and um, this pod and video going out. But we'll do our best, Andy. And over to you. Um, I guess first questions first, Arecibo. Uh, do you reckon it's the right horse at the top of the market? Yeah, based on his run in, in the King Stand, you'd, you'd have to say that. Um, uh, on, on the flip side of that argument, it, it's he's not the kind of horse that I generally like to back at, at, at when he's not an each-way prize, because I do think he's a horse that you always want the safety net of three places in place, because he has had his quirks in the past. Sometimes he hasn't always find, found as much off the bridle as, as, he, as, as anticipated. And um, a lot depends on looking running with a horse like that. Um, so he, he's been okay this season when you can, because he's been freely available to back a big price this season. It was mm-hmm. a big price in the King Stand. Uh, you know, it was a decent price the time before. I think he was about a seven or eight to one shot in the Palace House when he didn't get the clearest to run. So it's now a different entity completely looking at Arecibo having run a career high and all of a sudden now you're staring down a barrel of sort of seven or two. Um, that said, look, you know he's got the run. He's got the run star, the profile for a race like this. They're, they're bound to go hard. They always do have the straight five at Sandown, uh, and he, he is a strong finisher. So he's got that in his locker. Um, and with Jamie Spencer on board, I'm sure you'll get a great thrilling back in him. Um, he's just not for me the price. Look, I've got a, a huge amount of time for the horse, and, and Tom Morley's done really well with him. He's new owner. Um, fair play for him to pick, for picking him up at the sales race um, before the start of the season. Um, I, I think the best horse in the race based on what I've seen so far this season, he's came from the dark. I was really disappointed, like many, that he didn't make the King Stand gig. Um, Ed Walker's gone on record to say he, he, was, he just had a slight setback going into Ascot and it didn't enable him to get him there on time. But this race a couple of weeks later has enabled him to get him back to somewhere near where he wants him. I think he would have won the Palace House Stakes comfortably with a clear run. And he had Arecibo well beaten that day. On ground as well, that probably would have been a little bit lively for him. That good to firm ground that day on um, 2000 Guineas Day was rattling quick. 
and he wants a little bit of juice in the ground, which at the moment he looks like getting it soft, good to soft in places, softer mm. on the on the on the straight track than it is on the on the round track. And there are forecast showers, I think, George, in your area down there for sort of Friday stroke into Saturday. Not a huge quantity like we had at Royal Ascot, but the odd shower just to perhaps freshen it up a bit. Um, he's got a hold up run star, which means from store nine, life won't be easy, but he does finish his race off quite strongly. And coming off that, coming off the pace and coming down the middle of the track at Sandown recently hasn't been a bad tactic. So out of the front two in the market, I would lean, be leaning towards came from the dark. Um, and that's notwithstanding, we've got the likes of Lazuli and uh, Attilis Bay, who are both strong course and distance winners. And who equally have got very persuasive claims as well. I think arguably this race is more competitive than the actual King Stand at Royal Ascot. Um, you could argue and say it's a, it's a better race as well if you take Batash into the equation. This is a, this is probably brought together four or five of the best informed sprinters we've seen so far this season. It came from the dark. Bet three six five have just come out with their prices and are nine to two the best price at the moment. Before came from the dark, Tom Marquin rides, I'm sure, after Holly Doyle getting uh, more of a tune out of came from the dark this season than anyone has done so before. I'm imagining it, the Marquin Doyle household, that she's probably taking him through uh, what he needs to do on the day uh, to repeat the trick. But yeah, came from the dark, 9-2 to two, uh, for the Coral Charge, the one for Andy there, uh, the value for him. Uh, we'll move on to the second race that we're going to preview here. It's the one... Uh, the, sorry, the three o'clock, uh, the Coral Distaff, the Phillies listed race. And here we've got Statement who heads the market uh, at nine to four. Uh, Auntie Bridey is 15 to two, ready to venture, and uh, Aurea both eight to one. Seattle Rock 11 to one with Shine for You, the same price, and Lucid Dreamer. Uh, Kastena 12 to one, Glad the Gal 12 to one, 16 to one. Bar, Andy, how are you seeing this one? Yeah, th- this is a good betting race, uh, George. Um, I, I want to take on statement um, for reasons. Uh, fairly obvious reasons, really. I, I thought it was a bit disappointing at Epsom um, on, it might have been Oaks Day, it might have been Derby Day, I can't remember if it was Oaks Day or Derby Day, uh, behind Parents' Prayer, sent off 7 4 5 that day, off the back of a of a decent effort, it has to be said, in in the um, the Guineas behind Mother Earth. She showed well in, in the Fred Donlin as well, behind Alcohol Free. So those are her two sort of highlighted runs in Group One company coming into that race. Um, which is a similar race to what we, she's facing Saturday. And, and she rather fluffed the lines. You, you could put it down to Epsom not being her track, one, uh, one thing or another. But, yeah, she just didn't really pick up, didn't really come home with any great degree of authority. Um, I'm not absolutely convinced she's been getting the mile trip, if, if I'm being honest. Um, her best form last season was six, six furlongs, seven furlongs. The two runs over a mile have been, like I say, Okay, but they, they haven't, like I said, she hasn't hit the line really hard in both races. So I think the stiff mile at Sandown on good to soft ground might just be a bit too far for her. Certainly, the price is prepared to have a look. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But at nine to four, I'm prepared to let her win at that price. Um, I, th- I do think this race, like I say, is having up for a bit of each way um, um, value because we've got Auntie Bridie chalked up second favourite again. Got a huge amount of fun on its first one of the season. It was mm. last of the. I think it was 17 runners in the Fred Darling. I mean, it'd be very, very difficult to back a horse coming in here off the back of such a dodgy-looking profile. Uh, and and if you add on, on, on top of that the favourite as well, you, you've got opportunities here. The one I quite like is Aurea from the uh, Andrew Baldwin stable. Andrew's has just had an amazing season, hasn't he, with all his horses, T-Rolls, older horses, fillies, you name it. Um, and they, they seem to be staying and remaining in form um, as we... As we uh, cover this race. I actually think Creative Flair, the horse that she's finished second to, or behind, let's say, on, on her first two starts, starts of the season, is one of the best fillies we've seen so far this season. Certainly, time figure wise, Charlie Appleby's fillies knocked a couple of really big times out of the park, uh, particularly the race at Newbury last time out. They went a real good gallop. She had a right fisty cuffs with a horse called Lilac Road, um, and she, she got the better of Lilac Road on that occasion. Um, and back in fourth, fifth, fourth was Aurea, who just kept on at the one speed, but that was over a mile and a quarter. But her run the time before behind Creative Flair, when she hit the line really hard over a strong run, stiff mile on a turning right-handed track, which she faces on Saturday, was, was to my eyes, one of the best pieces of form coming into this race. Um, and I see it chalked up around about 10 to 1. Is that, is that right, George? Did you say 10 to 1? 8 to 1, best eight price to one. Mm. 
Yeah, eight to one. I I think that's cracking value. Um, Oshie Murphy obviously riding the crest of a wave as well. He takes the ride on on the horse, and I, I tend to not look at ratings in these races because I think the level of improvement is all at different kind of um, stages of the season. Um, something like Stateman, who's finished second in the Fred Doll, has has had a chance to post a uh, a rating of 106, but that doesn't mean to say that Aurea might not improve beyond that given an environment like this. Um, the handicapper can only just judge him on what he's seen so far, but I, I don't think there's a huge amount between the, the 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 capabilities and actually what their ratings suggest at the moment. So that's why I think all the prices are out of whack. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of Aurea, and I would probably be looking to put her up on Saturday if we could get <clears> somewhere in and around that price. When all the prices are out of whack, there's only one man you want telling you, and that's Andy, and he's put up Aurea at eight to one. That's best price with Bet three six five. Uh, move on then to the Coral Eclipse, the 335 at Sandown. Uh, and Mishrif is the 6-4 to four favourite ahead of St. Mark's Basilica at 13-8. to eight, And Adayeb at 130. El Drama picking up the pieces in the market at 25-1. to one. Just four runners. But as you say, Andy, or as you said at the beginning of the show, um, no short of class. Who do you think represents the value here to win the Coral Eclipse? Um, if I'm being absolutely honest, George... Um... I don't think there's a huge amount of value to be had um, at all. I, I, I think because the one thing we don't know in this race is, like we do in previous seasons, is how the race is going to be run. None of the four participants in the past wanted to make the running or have made the running. Um, something's going to have to change. Something's got to make the running. And I don't think any of us will know that. The only people that will know that are the connections themselves, the jockeys, the trainers going out in the post, how this is going to play out. We as a betting public can only surmise what might the running. Um, but until the race, the, the gates open up and they, they crash crash back and they go go forward for the first furlong, I, th- I, 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 I uh, challenge anyone to, to come up with a, a conclusion who's going, who's going to, what, the, what the running order, the pecking order is going to be after a furlong, who's going to be first, second, third, fourth. Um, so I think this boils down to what you believe or who you believe to the best horses and might be able to adapt to the conditions. Assuming the ground is going to be still on the easy side come Saturday, I'd probably just um, put my um, um, colours on the line with Mishrif because I think his body of work this season um, and in the last year really represents probably the most solid. Um, you know, he's winning the Saudi Cup. Uh, was uh, pretty amazing. He beat all the best American horses on ground on, on a surface that you wouldn't have necessarily thought he would be guaranteed to handle. That dirt surface is very, very tough, and he, he toughed it out. He then went to Maidan, and he won the Shima Classic. Again, a, a race littered with some of the best horses in the world. We're not talking about you know UK horses here and, and French mm. horses. They were a collection of some hugely popular and, and um, top-class globe-trotting horses, including the second um, the Japan horse. I forget its name now. Um, was it Chrono Genesis, I think, off, off, off memory? I'll have a look now. Um, and he, he toughed it out again. And, and he's just such yeah, a... Yeah, Chrono Genesis. Yeah. Chrono Genesis, yeah. I mean, one of the best horses in the world. You know, probably best in Japan. And he just did not want to get beat that day. Um, I just think his will to win and his attitude is phenomenal. And if it comes down to... Uh, a battle of wills, as it were. I, I think he might just have the better of, of Sir Mark's Basilica and Adair. But look, both of these two horses are uh, an amazing, an amazing. Um, they've got an amazing amount of talent. It's a whole another race hard for me to structureize or decompartmentalize because all of them have been racing on the continent, and mm. me being a speed figure man, I haven't got times for Riyadh or. You know, I don't do Chantilly times with Mark, Sir Mark's Basilic or, or, you know, um, uh, um, Longchamp. And, and obviously, a, Dave, a Dave's been running over in the continent as well. So, uh, every, all everything about this race is a tricky one for me to assess. So, I'm just going to go with Miss Rift just because I think he's the best horse. And he might well be the most adaptable to how this race is likely to be run. He might just make, might just make the run in and grind it out from the front. Miss Rift at six to four, then probably... The most likely winner in your eyes, Andy, rather than any any strong selection at that price. I think so. Yeah, I, I think it's a difficult race to summarise because we don't know the conditions, we don't know who's going to make the run in, yeah, and they're all different linking form lines coming in all all together all at once. So it's it's a real trappy race. Great great race to watch, but the difficult one to bet in. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting to see how the market develops over the next few days. Any other um, runners that caught your eye on, on Saturday's card at Sandown, Andy? Not particularly. There's, there's a couple more races at um, Haydock, which we'll get on to in a second, that I'll okay. mention um, off-piste. But um, yeah, I think, I think we'll move over to Haydock and talk about Perfect. a couple of their big races there and, and maybe mention one or two others there. Yeah, we'll go straight into the Bet365 Lancashire Oaks then, uh, obviously for fillies and mares over the extended one mile three. I think it's a mile four, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, Alpinista is the nine to four favourite ahead of Mystery Angel, 11 to two. Dubai Fountain is six to one. Tribal Craft, seven to one. La Loon, 11 to one. Uh, Macaui, 14 to one. 16 to one. Bar, over to you, Andy. Yeah, again, another race which is very much ground dependence. At time recording, it's good to soft. Um, there are forecast showers in the Lancashire area um, for Saturday morning and into sort of lunchtime. So that's very much going to set, sound the alarm bells for me with regards to Alpinista because she wants genuine good to firm ground. Um, like all good horses, she'll, she'll handle a bit of cutting the ground. But I think to be absolutely at her best, she she, she likes to hear her who's rattle, as she proved when she chased Ham Love last season in the Yorkshire Rogues. It was good to firm when she struggled to beat Macarway at... Um, Goodwood on her seasonal reappearance, and this has very much been the plan subsequently. Time figure wise, I can't fault her. She's always run some big numbers, but they've all been on good to firm ground. So if there is a little bit of juice in the ground, uh, I might want to look elsewhere for a bit of value alternative. And and I think Laloon is one that's likely to sort of slip under the radar. I do like the way Henry Candy's brought this filly along, gradually, gradually through the through the ranks. And um, her two victories this season have been. Um, Indicative of, of his training style, really. She she won at Nottingham and enlisted race first time out, and then she came here, went up to Group Three category, and again I thought one with a bit in hand. It was a, it was a deep field that day. There was only five runners, but um, th- there was a couple of strong form lines going into there with um, Oriental Mystique finishing third. She beat Caballetta Fair and Square. I like the way she was cooking up that day as well, um, and around sort of seven to one. I think that you, I heard your quote. Mm. Um, I, I think that's not not a bad shout. Um, I think eleven tribal, to one alone. Eleven to one. Wow, that's a lot mm. bigger than I thought. Um, I think Tribal Craft's another one you've got to factor into the equation. She wasn't good enough for Al- Alba Flora first time out at Ascot, but given a test of stamina over, on a quicker surface next time out at York, she was really good. Um, I could make a case out for her, and then of course you've got the the three Oz Dubai Fountain and um, Mystery Angel making it into a a fascinating all age contest. But ultimately, I think uh, Alpinist is a little bit too short. Um, and I think she's worth taking other prices, particularly if the rain comes. And Laloon strikes me at 11 to 1 to be slightly overpriced. I was going to ask you about Dubai Fountain because she's had an interesting few weeks. Absolutely yes. punt, punted off the boards for the Oaks into second favouritism. Genuinely, in the four minutes before the off, ran absolutely no race at all. Same thing happened again in the Ribblesdale. Again, smashed into 9 to 2 just before they went and probably ran a bit better than her placing of fifth would suggest. Coming into this one here, would you ever look? I mean, I know you're obviously, a, you know, you're, you're a time figure man and, and you look at what actually happens on course. But how do you assess a horse like that that's been obviously so well supported in a run up to two races where, you know, she wouldn't have to necessarily um, live up to those standards to win this? I, I, my assessment of, of her, George, is she probably hasn't got a, an ultimately strong constitution. It seems to be that way. I, I, her first two runs last season, she was really good. And then a, a form which was still good slightly tapered off and, and and she was very good first time out when she beat Ziada. Now the full line with Ziada, obviously who beat a good field at Newcastle the other day, he's he's exceptionally strong. But you'd have to say her Epsom uh, Oaks run was inexplicably badly and I, I wouldn't say she improved on it, you know, well she did improve on it, but not by an absolute massive quantities at, at Ascon in a more in a slightly more substandard race. Mm. Um I think she's gonna have to improve again like or um, come come back from the dead almost because off those two runs she's not the kind of horse I want to be back in 11 to 2 I'd rather back something like Laloon who's upward immobile got loads of confidence more reliable course and distance winner and, and he's, he's double the price um, yeah I, I, I find it very very difficult to, to find the confidence to back Dubai Fountain anyway at around the 11 to 2 mark at the moment interesting stuff yeah Laloon the one for Andy, uh, Henry Candy's Laloon, dropped up. Uh, will be ridden by David Prober on the day. Uh, you mentioned you had a couple more at Haydock, Andy. Uh, who have you got? Yeah, the, the, there's a couple of handicaps which, which interest me. I, I, I do like my three-year-old staying handicappers. Uh, I put a horse called Tashkan on the column 
um, at Royal Ascot. And um, although he didn't uh, ultimately finish in the frame, I thought he ran a smashing race. He was eighth behind um, the horse of Roger Varians that ended up winning. Um, I can't remember his name now. Um, but I was hugely, imp- I was still hugely impressed with Tashkan's run. He got drawn one and he went around the inside and he got trapped on the rail. It took him an age to get going. I don't think that short straight at Ascot did him any favours because when he went when he went at Haydock the time before and he beat the horse called Chalkstream, who, inden- who incidentally is my nap today on the column, I think I think we'll probably win at Haydock again. Once he got into top gear uh, down that long straight at Haydock, he was devastating. His back end sectionals are really good, uh, and I think going back to Haydock's a wise move. Um, I think the step up in triple suit him as well. He looked for all the world as well, running over that mile and a half um, in the King George was what he wanted. He wanted further than a mile and a half. Um, he looks an out and out star. I actually marked him down for the Melrose. I actually put my notes uh, next to his run last time out uh, uh, it, when I was doing my sheet. I, I've actually put Melrose in, in August for him. I think he's tailor made for that because he's proven at the track and the mile six on that galloping course is ideal for him. But look, he's got the next best thing, hasn't he? He's, got Hay- he's going back to Haydock, which he's already won, and he's over a mile six. He won't mind whichever the conditions are. If it's if it's good, he's fine because he handled it at York. If it's soft or heavy or whatever, they get a rain, he, he beats York Stream on soft ground. So, I mean, he, what is he? Is he? Did you say he's 14 to 1? 12, 12 to 1. I mean, 12 to 1 is absolutely mental. Um, I, I think that, that King George handicap is, is often every single season, George, is one of the most pivotal um, form lines of the whole season. And I'm pretty sure there's already been a horse come out of that and, and, and worn or run really well. It finished well down the field. I'd, I'd have to double check, but um, I won't, it wouldn't surprise me if that that chucks up horses that run well in group races this season. And I think he's like I said, I think he's better than what he showed in the last time. So he's the one I'll be looking to get with. And the old Newton Cup, um, a kind of race that's um, very um, a sought after prize and, and, and is a good, real good heritage handicap. I quite like the form line of the race that was won by Midnight's Legacy at um, Epsom on Derby Day. Now. It wasn't quite as strongly run as the Derby, but it wasn't far off. The time figure was probably about a second behind the Derby, but I've done the sectionals from the top of the hill. There's a couple of places where I do them from at Epsom. One at the top mm. of the hill, around about the sixth pole, and then from Saturn Corner. And Midnight's Legacy and um, Soto Sizzler ran the identical speed figures as Adi are. And when you consider Hurricane Lane was like six lengths back in third and has gone on to win an Irish Derby... These two horses were really turning it on, Midnight's Legacy and, and Soto Sizzler. And Soto Sizzler must have missed the break, I don't know if you remember, by about 10 mm. lengths. How he made that ground up and then got himself into the position where I, he nearly could win the race was quite phenomenal. It just shows you the kind of form he's in at the moment. Obviously, David Marnusia's horses are flying. Um, I'd probably be looking to back those two against the field because they come from yards that probably don't have the following that they, they the likes of uh, you know, a, 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 like a Mark Johnson of William Haggis, a, 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 a Ed and Simon Christopher do, and, and they've got horses that are chalked up a lot shorter. But I think their form line is just as strong. And Midnight's Legacy is a course and distance winner as well. Um, I, I, I do think that horse has got a massive chance along along with Soto Sizzler. So wouldn't be surprised if those two went up on the column as a couple of each way bets against the field, particularly if firms are going to be paying five or even six places in a race like that come Saturday. Yeah, the golden eggs there for those who've continued watching or listening <clears throat> to the end of this podcast. Soto Sizzler, 20 to 1 with Unibet as it stands. Midnight Legacy, 12 to 1 with Bet365. That is for the old Newton Cup, the 315 at Haydock on Saturday. And the first one you mentioned there as well, Tashkan, 12 to 1 in the 205 at Haydock, the Bet365 handicap. And that brings us to an end of our racing previews. Just one more question for you, Andy. Is it coming home? Well, I'd be surprised if we don't get to the final. Um, yeah, we should beat Ukraine really with the, with the squad that we've got. I think the key is as well we've got a hell of a lot of fresh players which you can bring on at will. And when you look at the like for like that we can slot into these positions, you know Jordan Henderson for either Rice or or, or Phillips, and then you know you've got the likes of um, you know Jack Grealish if he starts and uh, Mason Mount. We haven't even seen Sancho. I think he's done it six, six mm-hmm. minutes on the pitch. Foden as well, who only had their one game. I mean, the embarrassment of Richie's at his disposal is quite incredible. And and I think we could afford to sort of play fairly cagey, but then bring these goods on, good you know, big guns on in the second half and, and just run a mock like we did against Germany. Um, 
Yeah, and I mean, obviously, you know, if we get if we get Denmark or Czech Republic again, we'd be heavy favourites to win that those two games back at home as well with a bigger crowd. And I'd say if we got to the final, we dare to dream. But eighty thousand partisan Wembley, you, you, the players must feel like they're floating on an airplane that game. So we'd never ever have a better chance of of winning a tournament than this one. I don't think. Yeah, I was I was at Wembley for the Croatia game for the Czech Republic game. And then again on Tuesday for the Germany game and um, the difference in terms of, of noise and intensity for Tuesday was just something else. And I, and I agree with you. I think if we can get through Saturday, um, then having home advantage will be massive. Um, you know, this isn't a, a football pod, um, but I've got one and I never give selections. I think the last time I did it was, what was it? It was that winner in, um, what was it? It was when it was, I can't remember even what, what it was. It was uh, when the King was on the uh, throne, wasn't it, George? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was over the jumps. But anyway, I'm going to give you one now. It's 50, 50 to one shot in the football and it's Harry Kane to be player of the tournament. I mentioned it to Andy off air before. It is a massive price. It massively overestimates the importance of the group stages in that first game. There are three games to go. If England are nine to four to win the Euros, there's absolutely no chance that Kane, who will play every single minute that he's fit uh, of those three games, is that price to win player of the tournament. He's four to one to score a brace against Ukraine on Saturday. If he does that, He's probably going to come in to shorten up, shorten up his favourite. Raheem Sterling is seven to one, um, best price to win it. That discrepancy is huge. Way too much emphasis put on those first few games. So thank me, um, and it's one fun way. You know, when England are nine to four, it's a good way to try and uh, have a bet on on England to do okay for the rest of it. So don't blame me when it goes wrong. At least it's big enough price. A random football tip there for you at the end of this uh, Coral Eclipse preview. Before I let you go, just going to point you in the direction of the Odds Checker app for the very best tipsters. That is Andy and not myself uh, on the app every morning uh, of racing. The best prices. Bookie offers free bets and place terms there as well. Make sure you do check out Andy's column, both on Saturday morning and throughout the season. Always an excellent read, whether you're backing your selections uh, or you just want to get a good feel for the day's racing as well. Please do subscribe to our youtube channel for plenty more previews and other bits and bobs across different sports and all sorts of other things loads more planned as well uh, for the summer so do subscribe there or to the podcast on any podcast provider as well do enjoy the racing and most importantly please do gamble responsibly